please welcome Dr. Mike Dorkin. Right, it's bright out here. I can't see if anyone's in the room, but I'm sure there are uh, some people. Thank you all very much for coming back uh, so promptly after such a short break. I think uh, each year we learn that we need longer networking sessions in between sessions. Um, so thank you very much uh, for coming. Uh, we heard briefly um, at the previous panel session the use of the safe surgical checklist, um, uh, which was a seminal introduction of change um, that has resulted in, in both a reduction in harm, but also in a reduction in deaths in and around the operating theater or stroke rooms. And so uh, I think it's very interesting that we now have one of the leading researchers um, in safety uh, and systems um, who is joining us this afternoon. So Evan Benjamin, who was uh, based up in the, the Northeast in, in Massachusetts at, at Brigham and, uh, and other systems up there, uh, and he's also got joint appointments uh, in public health, um, has translated himself into uh, working now um, as the chief medical officer, advisor, leader, um, changist uh, at Ariadne Labs, which as most of you will know, was set up um, as a vehicle for Atagwandi, who was one of the um, uh, original drivers for the safe surgery checklist, among other, other things. So it's a great privilege that we have with us today, I think, one of the leading researchers in our world, uh, but also someone who is passionately after, I, we had discussions last night about change, not just uh, in this country, the United States, but in many other systems uh, across the world. Um, and uh, one of our themes of today and tomorrow is uh, that we are a global community. Uh, we're a global community where many of the systems around our world need help. Um, they need help uh, because they are in fragile conflict systems, but they all need, also need help um, because uh, they can change their systems. Um, the element of frugal innovation is really writ large across most of the global south. Um, and uh, we can learn as much as we can give uh, from those systems. So what I'd like to do now is introduce uh, Evan Benjamin, who is going to thrill us uh, over the next 15 to 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evan. Thank you. Please welcome Dr. Evan Benjamin. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Uh, I come from uh, Boston, Massachusetts. And I work at uh, a small place called Ariadne Labs. Uh, Ariadne Labs is an uh, innovation center at the Harvard School of Public Health and at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. And Ariadne, um, for those of you who recall your Greek uh, philosophy, uh, Ariadne was uh, a goddess who was so in love uh, with another god, Theseus, but worried about Theseus because Theseus's task was to go into the labyrinth and kill the Minotaur and then find his way out. And Ariadne was so worried, and many people have tried to go into the labyrinth and out. They would use breadcrumbs and go in and out, but the problem is the, the birds would come and eat the breadcrumbs. So Ariadne devised a very simple tool, which was she gave Theseus a, a thread, and Theseus could find his way in and find his way out. And uh, Dr. Atul Gawande, who founded Ariadne, loved that story because what Ariadne did was use a, a very simple tool for a very complex problem. And that became sort of the, the basis for our work at Ariadne, to design simple tools that can help complex uh, problems. So today I'm going to discuss how we can improve the way that healthcare responds to harm. The first harm is unintentional. The second is intentional. And I want to thank uh, Carol Hemmelgarn for inspiring the title of this talk. Carol, I think you're here. Thank you. Because, um, you know, when we harm patients, it's almost always unintentional. 
But when we respond poorly or not at all, the second harm uh, is actually intentional. When, when harm occurs or an unexpected adverse event occurs, patients and their families, their world turns upside down. Um, so many questions emerge. How did this happen? Why me? How will I be cared for now? How will this be prevented in the future? Is there any accountability? And yet, all too often, what patients hear is this, silence. The health system and clinicians are not trained nor prepared to have this difficult conversation. The legal team is concerned that saying more will lead to expensive lawsuits. In this moment of probably the most patient vulnerability, healthcare is often at its worst in terms of true patient-centeredness. The result that we see is, is despair. Despair on the part of the patient, uh, depression and anxiety about what happened, uh, about their health and concerns about the healthcare delivery system which has failed them. And we also see on the part of the provider and the clinician also despair. There's been a violation of the clinician's desire to help to cure patients and then to communicate and to explain. And clinicians often feel helpless after a harm event, which really contributes to their own professional burnout. The problem is that despite our best efforts, harm happens in the delivery of healthcare. The deny and defend approach which is an approach that really waits for the patient to recognize the adverse event, then complain about it, and then file a lawsuit. Uh, and then the system defends itself against these lawsuits. This approach has failed us. It's failed us from the perspective of, of the patients, and it's failed us from the perspective of how do we improve our system. We've been doing research in this for about 20 years, and we now have a really good understanding then it really shows that this approach, this deny and defend approach, really compounds the suffering of patients. It heightens the distress of clinicians. It actually increases, not decreases, the likelihood of litigation. It discourages learning about patient safety. It degrades the institutional culture that so many organizations are trying to build, a culture of safety and transparency. Uh, and it reduces trust in the healthcare system, not just that particular system that where the harm occurred, but in the health system writ large. Patients often do not want to continue to get care. So why do we struggle? Why do we just struggle to have to respond to harm events? Well, I think it's human nature, right? It's human nature to keep problems to ourselves and to avoid difficult conversations. We also get uh, mixed messages from institutions. There's a status quo. Some organizations say, no, you can say what you want, but just don't say that. Um, there's, there's fear that people have of, of punitive consequences, of there's shame, there's embarrassment. And finally, there's really just lack of skills uh, there's lack of skills of different elements of the response. It's very difficult to do. In addition, there's a lot of uncertainty. I think uncertainty among clinicians about what they should and should not say after a harm event. There are many complex cases which I think create some gray areas and people don't know what to do. But really, it's, there's poor implementation. There's a lack of tools, a lack of resources, a lack of standard work, a lack of measures. How do you know if you're responding to harm in a, in a way, and how can you improve upon it without measures? So what is communication and resolution programs? You heard it from the National Action Alliance. We've heard it from PCAST. We've heard it from the CMS Structural Measures. 
A CRP, and I'm trying to use the term reconciliation and move away from resolution, our patients tell us that resolution is an industry term. Oftentimes, if someone has been seriously harmed or have died as, as a result of harm, there is no resolution. So a communication and reconciliation program is, first of all, it's principled. It's based on what is right and what is just for all patients. It's comprehensive. It's an entire approach that you see in the diagram from reporting about harm to communication to patients to learning about the event to moving to reconciliation. It's systematic in that it occurs for every harm event, for every patient and not selectively. And it's compassionate. It supports patients uh, and their families in this time of need uh, and supports them with follow-up resources as necessary. CRPs help move from the traditional deny and defend a response to a more transparent response with immediate communication. They help organizations learn from errors and they help move earlier to financial resolution for patients who've been harmed while also creating a supportive environment for both the patient and the caregiver, taking, care, taking the fear and anxiety out of an already very stressful process. Now, there actually is a body of literature around this. There actually is an evidence base around it, and it continues to grow. Done right, CRPs consistently can help. They, you, they can actually preserve the trust of, by the patient uh, of the healthcare delivery system. Um, and you can reduce distress among clinicians because clinicians are also being supported. CRP can reduce the likelihood of litigation, actually decrease the very thing that some of our risk and legal colleagues fear. It can promote learning about adverse events and error. It strengthens the institutional culture, the culture that so many of us that you've heard here that are, have been working for so many years to create these institutional cultures and climate regarding safety and transparency. It can actually lower the likelihood of multidiscipline of actions, and it can increase the public trust in, in healthcare. So we know this approach is so much more effective than a traditional approach, and yet CRP continues to be a seen often as a risk management tool. Uh, these are articles here by my colleague Tom Gallagher and myself that really highlight how CRP is not a part of a legal response. It is not a risk management tool. It really, CRP needs to be seen as a cr mission critical for an organization, for an organization that wants to learn about harm, it wants to prevent error, prevent harm, and it wants to have its mission of, of curing patients and supporting patients and families. CRP is part of this modern ethical paradigm to do the right thing, and oh, by the way, it does the right thing to improve patient safety and financially even makes sense. The challenge of inconsistent implementation. So I've been doing this work for 20 years. I've interviewed hundreds of patients who've been harmed and seen dozens and dozens of healthcare facilities working on CRP programs. And what we often see is inconsistent implementation. We see it mostly being run by risk and legal. And you see that CRP is being used for some cases, but not others. Some cases are usually the most egregious cases that everyone knows, and it's thought of as an early settlement program, not as a true communication, transparency, supportive learning program. But we also see it sometimes when each case uses some of the elements of CRP, but not all of them. All this does is fuel the skeptics' concerns that CRP is really a risk management tool to save money and that really raises doubts about the commitment the organization has towards transparency and a safety culture. But ultimately, when there's inconsistent implementation, fewer patients 
families and clinicians benefit from all the benefits and processes that I described earlier. Now, you heard earlier that the CMS has passed the patient safety structural measures. Uh, they were just published on uh, October 28th, and they will be taking effect uh, October uh, 1st of this year. There are five domains that were there uh, that you saw that uh, Dr. Amshad shared with you. Uh, in the fourth domain, under accountability and transparency, there was a specific call out to communication and resolution programs asking for our hospitals to attest that they have a evidence-based program in place and that they also can track the performance of their program. In other words, is it consistent? Is every case being tracked and worked on in terms of communication and learning and transparency? We all, in addition to this, we heard about the PCAST report, which also specifically calls out the CRP programs and the National Action Alliance making specific recommendations uh, to support CRPs based on the evidence base which exists. So this evidence base is very broad. Uh, we've seen how CRPs can impact and support uh, being aligned with the patient and the family and their preferences. We can see how they're aligned with the professional perspectives. As I mentioned, ultimately it's clinicians that need to control once care changes and this harm that impacts patients. What is the perspective of professions? It's not to deny and defend. It's naturally to learn and to communicate. CRPs also are sensitive to the fact that when harm occurs, it's affecting patients physically and it's affecting them emotionally and non-physically. And CRPs are associated with actually a decrease in the post-event suffering uh, that patients and families have. It's associated uh, in how it supports professionals. CR good CRP programs have great peer-to-peer -peer support programs baked into them, hardwired into them. I mentioned the culture of safety and how CRP really reinforces the safety culture that most organizations are trying and has actually positive medical legal experience. Uh, in a number of studies, we've seen actually decreases in defense costs and liability costs, and other studies have shown very neutral. But more importantly, even in those neutral studies, what we didn't see was an avalanche of new claims or lawsuits because we communicated, which has always been the fear of our legal colleagues. So we've come together. Uh, Ariadne Labs uh, and the Collaborative for Accountability and Improvement, part of the University of Washington, uh, and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement to create a collaborative. It's a learning collaborative. We've realized the importance of this and the importance of getting CRP consistently implemented. And these three organizations came together. We built a learning collaborative. It's a 12-month collaborative. We've had two cycles thus far. We've had about 44 health systems go through. We've created new tools uh, and new measure sets uh, to really help organizations consistently implement the CRP. These are just some of the tools we put together. You can't just do this based on a philosophy. You actually need support. We've, we have a process map and a driver diagram, like good improvement folks, that all of our uh, participants uh, modify for themselves. We have training and communication. We have case discussions. We have a resolution and reconciliation toolbox. How do you have these hard conversations? Pathway to support uh, patients and a whole measurement guide of how to know, are you, are you doing this well? Uh, this is just our, uh, our pathway. Uh, and you can see we break it down by the event. It starts with the definition on the top right corner. We have systems say, define what is harm for you. And once you define what harm is, and we have various measures, consistently, every case now that meets that definition of harm will be taken through your CRP pathway. And your CRP pathway, there's an early and a middle and a late. You can see on top and on the y-axis these activities of how we engage patients and families, how we support staff, how we do event management, 
and how we move this through learning and ultimately reconciliation. In blue are all of the tools that we've developed to support uh, this process. So the first harm is intentional. The second is unintentional. The second is intentional. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can move this to get to consistent implementation of CRP so people can say that this is part of who they are in their heart of how we want to improve patient safety. Um, so I will thank you there.